One step at a time. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Praise the Lord. How you doing, Alan? Good. Praise the Lord. Me too, brother. We're starting a series of messages today that we're going to call Journey to the Cross. And this series of messages will take us right up to Easter where we preach on the resurrection. So I guess we could say Journey to the Resurrection. But the bulk of it will deal with those, those steps up to the cross and getting to the cross of, of Christ. And I believe it's an important series of messages as I begin to study this particular uh, scope of messages and preparing for the series. I thought, well, six sermons would be good, six weeks as we get up to it. And then I realized I should have started in January. <clears throat> There's just a whole lot, you know, when you get into the Bible and you see all that, uh, it, that's written there about those last hours from, from, from the upper room experience to the, to the resurrection, that, that period of time. It's phenomenal as to what the Lord is doing and what's happening in these moments. So we're going to kind of capture some of that as we look at this Journey to the Cross series and see what the Lord has for it. We'll, we'll cover each segment like from the upper room on down. But let me say that the context of everything of these messages is pretty simple. It's, it's the gospel, all right? So you're going to be hearing gospel message clearly, loudly, ringing loudly and clearly, of which we are not ashamed of the gospel. I believe it's the power of the gospel that transformed lives. And they're bringing my sermon up. We'll give me just a moment back there to finish doing that because I, I made some changes there to it. So uh, my, my problem with the music stuff here in the last couple of songs, I crashed the computer. So it's just how good a sermon this is going to be. <laughs> or maybe it's not so good. I don't know. <laughs> if it crashed the computer, it's just too much to handle. Maybe there's too much power coming into it. But the idea is that the gospel is so clear, you know, and so many churches have turned their back on preaching the gospel. It's really disheartening when you look across the culture and the age that we live in. How many places we, that, that, that we're exposed to and how many churches that I know of who really, you just don't hear the gospel message anymore because it's offensive in so many ways. And before this message is over, you'll see exactly what I mean as we walk through just the, the upper room experience. And that's what we're going to be dealing with specifically today in this message on Journey to the Cross. It is just what takes place in this portion, on this evening, in the, the upper room. And we're going to start and walk through each aspect of what happened that night. And the first of what we'll look at has to do with the, the washing of feet. And then we'll talk about the Passover, Judas, the betrayal, and those kind of things as well. And, but we want to just capture a little bit of each one of these. Every one of these four or five different things we'll talk about today really are a sermon in and of themselves. But we'll, we'll try to be brief, but at the same time, we don't want to miss what the Lord would have us to, to, to look at. Remember, as they gather it's Passover, it's a solemn time, but yet it's an exciting time. I know it's hard to com combine those two. I think the thing we probably come closest to, to if, you, if you're really in love with the Lord, you, when you enter into the time where we take communion together, and there's that element of... Uh, of uh, reverence that's a part of that and recognition and humility of realizing all the Lord's done for you and what, the, what all those things represent, the body, the blood of the Lord Jesus, the bread, the juice, those things. It's, it, there's this element of we're just, we're just humbled. But at the same time as, as we wrap it all up and Jesus said, this, do, do all this in remembrance of me, I believe there's also an anticipation for the Lord's return. There's an excitement in our own spirit. I really believe, as I'll share a little bit more about the Lord's Supper in just a moment, the institution of it, that there's that, that kind of general theme, if we really enter into it with a heart that's right and ready to receive the Lord's Supper, there should be that kind of, that kind of mixed emotion that goes into it. And I believe as they're gathered here in this upper room where the Lord Jesus sends them, you know, there's that same kind of thing. It is Passover, by the way, which is a time of celebration as well as a time of sobriety. It's a time of, oh, well, my mother uses the term quietude. It's, I had to look it up, but it's a real word, okay? But <laughs> a time of holiness, solemnity, quietude, but at the same time, there's an element of excitement as people bring those Passover lambs up to Jerusalem that they've been under examination and bring them in, in, up to the, the priest to be sacrificed. And the whole Passover meal was a time of uniqueness. They would gather together in those times and there would be one child from the family who would come and ask this question, what makes this night different from all the other nights? And it would be answered throughout the Passover meal as they celebrated the, the, the uh, deliverance from the Egyptian bondage that they were in. But the Lord begins this time as they gather in the upper room and, and look, wants to look at some scriptures in John 13 and, and look and exactly see what's going on here and, and the attitude of the Lord Jesus himself at this time because I believe it's, it's mixed as well as he knows. There's just this, he knows what's ahead of him. He knows what he's getting ready to do. But at the same time, he's with his brothers. He's with the disciples, all right? It says now, <clears throat> verses 1, 2, I, I don't have on the screen, but I do want to read them. 
And then we'll look at verse 3. It says, Now before the feast of Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During the supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. And then it picks up to verse 3 here. It says that Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he'd come forth from God, was going back to God, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself about. And he poured water into the basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel in which he was girded. And so it came to Simon Peter, he said to him, when he came to Peter, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I do, you do not realize now, but you shall understand hereafter. And Peter said to him, never or you shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to the Lord, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, he who hath bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who is betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. Now he starts out this passage, you know, in chapter 13 of Jesus knowing all things. Now obviously, here's the Son of God. Can you imagine being in that upper room? You know, they, they've gathered there for that memorial meal of celebration and deliverance. At the same time, here's Jesus knowing that he is the actual fulfillment of everything that Passover represents. And he knows where he's going. He knows where he's coming from. There's no identity crisis here with Jesus, all right? He knows exactly what's going on. And he rises and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. Now, those, the context of that alone is just mind-blowing, that here is all authority. Here, here he is knowing exactly who he is. And, he's, and uh, you know, first time I started reading this as a young believer, I thought, well, you know, here's, here, this is a big rebuke. Here, here is Jesus. His feet should have been the first one to be washed by the disciples and probably was the job of John or Peter because they got the room ready to wash the other disciples' feet. And, you know, nobody's getting their feet washed at this point. It should have been the first action of the night as people entered, but nobody did it. In fact, if you turn the clock back a day or so, you'll see the disciples arguing about who's going to be the greatest. So nobody in that group is going to wash anybody else's feet. Amen. And, and some of you might think, well, that's your trouble. But when you think about the camaraderie that you have with brothers and sisters and people that are closer, your best friends and stuff, you know, you, you, you know you're waiting for them to wash your feet. And, you know, it's just anyway, it's, it's, it can be a guy thing too here, all right? It really gets down to pride. But here's Jesus, and I think, well, boy, here's an ultimate rebuke. And in, in, in so many ways it was, but don't miss the heart of this. The heart of this is this is Jesus, all right? He is the Son of God. And he is moving and acting purely and solely with a heart of compassion and love and gratefulness to these men who are basically the pillars of the church who serve as his bride, literally. He is washing the bride's feet. He's moving. And yes, when Jesus does move, even when we see him at the cross, there's an object lesson to bring brokenness to us and humility to us. It should but that wasn't the reason ultimately is Jesus making the sacrifice for our sins, Jesus washing the disciples' feet. It wasn't necessarily meant to be a rebuke, uh, although because of his humility, his compassion, it was a rebuke in a sort, but more than that, don't miss the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ here, who is the very Son of God, who's God veiled in flesh, who loves these men so much and loves us so much. The Bible says in that verse thir uh, chapter 13, verse 1, it says, having loved his own, he loved them to the end. And I believe this is purely an act of love and compassion, a demonstration of, 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 of a lesson of life and freedom and cleansing. He says, what I'm doing now, you, you don't completely understand, all right? But you will know. And the whole idea here is that, you know, you have been selected, you have been, you have been set apart, you are the pillars of the bride, the church the, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what I do to you, I do for everyone. You have been made clean. And I do for everyone who comes to me and follows me is like you have in faith. You know, that, that's the heartbeat of everything going on here. He loves us and he washes us. And now he moves to wash our feet. Of course, the disciples aren't washing each other's feet. But Jesus moves and with authority, with grace, 
with beauty, with love. I mean, there's just, I believe it's a holy moment. He loves these men dearly. Don't let it pass you by for a moment that as much as he loved Peter and John and all those disciples, he loves you too. And he loves me too. And sometimes I think we miss that because we're kind of looking at the object lesson perhaps. Maybe what's the deal? Well, the deal is God loves you. The deal is God sacrificed himself, his son on your behalf and on my behalf. The deal is that he has washed us and made us whole. And even to the point, the Bible tells us he becomes our advocate and our intercessor. And the whole, if you want to look at some of the object lesson, it would really get down to this. When he talks to Peter, and Peter says, Lord, you know, and boy, but then he opt act in two different extremes all the time. I can relate. How about you? One extreme is, you're not going to wash my feet. You know, I, I, I'll be washing your feet, but you're the Lord. You don't wash my feet. And then Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part. Wash everything. <laughs> wash it all. Wash my head, wash my back, my hands, wash, get the whole thing. And Jesus said, no, you've already, he who has bathed does not need to be bathed again. You've been made clean. I just need to deal with your walk, your feet. You've been, you've been walking on dirty paths. Listen, we live in a sinful world, and the Bible says because sin abounds, the love of many can wax cold. And because we're so surrounded and our flesh, which is still part of our lives, is so prone to failure and to sin and disobedience, there's times we just need to get our feet, our walk, basically, is what it represents. We get our walk right with God. That's that First John 1, 9 in, in, in a picture here, that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us, to, to cleanse us from all, you know, all unrighteousness and to make us holy clean again. But the idea here is, is a foot washing. I know there's some denominations that have made this like a, a sacrament, like baptism or the Lord's Supper. That's not what, that wasn't the intent here, all right? To, and Jesus doesn't say to make it. He said the, the institution of the Lord's Supper, you will do this, and as often you do it. But not so with this. This was a, a, a clear picture of, number one, his love, his compassion, his deep concern, but also of the daily cleansing that we all need in Jesus Christ. We've been bathed by the blood already. We've been made whole and right with Christ if we are Christians. And now it goes to the point where, you know, the, the, we, we, can, we get dirty in the life that we live. We walk in a world. We, we fail. We stumble. James said we all stumble in many ways. We come in repentance and we come in confession to the Christ and praise Him and worship Him for what He's done for us. And we experience that daily cleansing that we so desperately need. So here they are in the room and Jesus has washed their feet. He's ministered to them on this level. He's told them, you know, that this is, that, but not all of you are clean, that there's someone here that is not clean. I've bathed all but one, and this cleansing foot washing is not going to change him. Now, part of all this, remember, is the Passover meal. In fact, the Passover meal is mentioned seven times in the Bible, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The first Passover, obviously, when they were in Egyptian bondage, the Lord said, I'm going to set you free. Sprinkle, take up an unblemished lamb, sacrifice it, sprinkle the blood on the doorpost of your house, and everybody whose house has the blood sprinkled on it, the death angel will not visit there. But every home that doesn't have blood sprinkled upon the doorpost, the death angel is going to visit there, and the firstborn child is going to die. That night there was weeping and wailing heard throughout Egypt. But not so in the homes of those who'd applied the blood to their homes. And this is what Passover was all about. So it was, also, it was also about celebration, not only from deliverance, but not only from, from cleansing, but here we see the grace of God. Seven times it's mentioned. The last time, first time, we see it when they celebrate it the first time with the, the, in, in Egypt. The last time here in Jerusalem, up on the mountaintop in that upper room where they're taking the Passover meal, that is the last time it's mentioned in Scripture. And we know that seven, according to the Bible, is the number of completion. So this, was, this completed Passover, basically. And it was the Lord Jesus who basically comes as a fulfillment to the whole things. There's several facts I want to just show you this morning and just to kind of hit this part of what's happening. is fact number one from the Old Testament. The lamb that you presented had to be spotless and unblemished. It couldn't be tainted in any way. Well, you refer to the New Testament. Jesus is that fulfillment of the lamb without spot or without blemish. He had no sin in him. First Peter says we were not... We weren't redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold or from by the vain traditions received by, from our fathers, but we were redeemed with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ who was like a lamb without spot or without blemish. Jesus ultimately personified, was the basic fulfillment of those prophetic pictures of that lamb. What did John the Baptist declare of Jesus the day he baptized him? He said, Behold the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus was without sin. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin, that you and I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So we see Jesus as the fulfillment. Fact number two, the Old Testament Passover is this, this, that in the Old Testament, the lamb had to be under examination for several days to make sure, three or four days to make sure that it was pure and clean. The lamb had to be taken into the home by those who would present the lamb to make sure there was no diseases and nothing wrong with the lamb and that it was really an unblemished, spotless, and clean lamb. For days, it had to be, there had to be this observation. Well, Jesus ministry lasted three or four, not days, but year. He was under constant examination. But he also arrived in Jerusalem. If you look at the timeline of these last days of the Lord Jesus Christ in, in, in this earthly ministry, if you look at the timeline, he was in Jerusalem three and a half to four, four days under the scrutiny of the priest and the high priest and the Pharisees. Constantly there was this contention that where they were kind of examining him, questioning him, looking at him. So he, he met that criteria. But not only so, he went before the Gentiles, Herod and Pilate. Pilate said, said I, I find no fault. There's no blemish with this lamb, with, with this man. I find no fault in him. Sent him to Herod. Herod didn't find anything to accuse him of. Finally, the, the Pharisees and the, the high priest had to get together some false witnesses just to come up with some occasion on which they could accuse the Lord Jesus Christ of. So he was there. Fact number three is in the Old Testament in regard to Passover and the Passover lamb. The blood had to be sprinkled upon the doorpost. If the blood's not on the doorpost, death enters into the house. For us in the New Testament, Jesus' blood has to be applied to our life. And how do we make the application? By putting our faith in him by choosing to follow him, by putting our trust in him. For with a heart a man believes unto righteousness. That's when the blood's applied to our life and to our case and to our cause. It's not just good enough that the blood was shed for you. You have to have some point of appropriation in your life where you're willing to, by faith, trust Christ as your deliverer, as your savior, as your Lord. That's when the blood of Jesus is applied. The fourth fact I wanted to catch briefly this morning about regard to Passover, and again, there's a whole sermon we could preach on all these things. The Passover lamb had to be eaten. It was taken to the home after the blood was shed and after it was sprinkled, it had to be eaten. Hebrews 11 says, through faith they kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest they be destroyed, the firstborn should be destroyed from among them. If there's no blood applied, if there's no application, then then you, 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 death enters in. And after the blood's applied, the lamb was set down at a meal and it was eaten. And Jesus Christ makes it very clear to us that he is one whose life must be received. You trust in him. The Bible likens it unto, likens faith or belief unto drinking from the fountain of life or drinking the water. It refers to faith in regard to eating. The Lord's Supper, we'll look at in a moment, has to do with the aspect of eating. Jesus at one time talked to the people who were following him the believers, as well as those who were just amongst the multitude, and said, listen, you, you, truly, truly, verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And it says, from that day, many people quit following him. Now, in a Gentile mindset, non-Hebrew culture, we would look at that and say, well, what in the world is he talking about? Is that cannibalism? Is that what he's talking about? That's not what he's making reference to. If you were a Jewish person in that day, you would know well what he was talking about. He was talking about a covenant relationship. And one aspect of a covenant relationship was that you and I become one, all right? That your life is part of my life, my life is part of your life, and we would receive a covenant meal together. And the covenant meal would be a, a, an eating and a drinking of, uh, of, of wine, of the juice, and of the bread. And it represented, the bread and the wine represented our life. You see that in marriage relationships. Marriage is a covenant. People, they make their vows to one another, and then there's reception where they, they share the cake and the glass, and they drink from it. All that was symbolic. But the truth of the matter is, Jesus is not symbolic. This is fulfillment here. And he said, unless you're willing to take me into your life, I don't have any part with you. And there's a lot of people that say, that's just too much. I'm not about to make that kind of commitment on that kind of level where I'm responsible for him and he's responsible for me that we are, we are prone and committed to one another from this point on. And so they turn back from following him. Not because he's talking about cannibalism, because I think they understood the context of the covenant that we're talking about here. So if you choose to follow Jesus, 
It's more than just saying, okay, I want to be baptized. I want to be sprinkled. I want to go through some kind of confirmation with the church. You know, I'm going to be a good person. I'll turn over a new leaf, whatever. That's not what the Bible talks about in regards to Christianity or salvation. I know that's preached a lot, that you need to be a good boy, you need to be a good girl. If you're a good person, you know, you'll die one day and go to heaven. But the Scriptures never teach that. In fact, the Scriptures teach just the opposite of that, that you could never be good enough to get to heaven because you've been defiled by sin. It's within your nature that you're born in sin. The Bible says by one man's disobedience. In Romans chapter 4 and chapter 5 makes it very clear. It's, we all become sinners. But when we put our faith in Christ Jesus, He comes into our life, we have His life within us, and we are made new and we're made clean and we're made right. And that's what Passover was such a symbol of, and many people miss it. So here they are in the upper room. Jesus first washing the disciples' feet, making very clear, by the way, that he came not to be served, but to serve. Not to get, but to give. Which really ought to be the anthem of our own lives. Too many people sitting around wanting somebody to do something for them, when we ought to be concerned about what we can do for each other for the glory of God. Amen. So they moved to the, 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 the Passover meal, and we could go into a lot about that. We'll skip over that. To the end of the Passover meal, when Jesus takes that cup of redemption, and he takes the unleavened bread, and he hands it before him, and he institutes the Lord's Supper, which we celebrate communion. What we'll do is we get through this sermon series. The Sunday after Easter, once we've finished it all, we're going to celebrate by taking communion together as a body, all right, and fellowshipping in the Lord together over a communion meal. But out of that Passover, this is where the institution of the Lord's Supper comes. The Lord Jesus takes that bread, and he, which is the unleavened bread. Remember, it, it had to be unleavened. Remember at Passover and the, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread? You'd have this week leading up to Passover that you'd get out anything in your house that had leaven in it. Yeast is basically what it is, all right? And even the Passover bread could not have any yeast in it. What does yeast do? Well, yeast causes a little reaction when, a, when heat comes. It, it creates a gas and it causes bread or whatever it is to rise. And that's where Paul was talking about, you know, he said a lot of you are puffed up. You know, you got a lot of knowledge, but no love. You got a lot of knowledge, but no humility. That's, that's leaven, all right? And so the Feast of Unleavened Bread leading up to Passover was to get rid of the sin. Get your hearts right. Get things clean. Get ready. You know, to, to celebrate. Have, it's like when we take the Lord's Supper. He says, you don't come and take the Lord's Supper with dirty hearts, you know. Make sure that you've judged yourself. You know, that you've looked at your own heart. You've examined yourself so that you'll eat this in a worthy manner to honor the Lord with. And so Jesus takes that cup, and we talked the last time we did the Lord's Supper about that particular cup, so we won't get into that today. And he took the bread. The first thing was the bread. Now, there's another passage earlier where Jesus is preaching to the multitudes in John chapter 5 when he says, I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. I'm the living bread. And he talked about the Old Testament and the wilderness experience and the manna. Jesus represented that daily sufficiency. All right? He is our daily sufficiency. Give us this day our daily bread. That goes well beyond just asking God to meet our physical needs for nutrition and for life, for, for the resource for living that day. I think it's also talking about our spiritual bread which is the filling and the yielding to the Word of God, to the Holy Spirit, to the Lordship of Jesus. So he takes the bread. Now, and follow the, the way it works here, and we'll briefly just look at this. But first of all, he takes the bread, and he, he, he looks unto heaven, and, and he gives thanks. Now, stop there just for a moment. He knows everything getting ready to come. He knows, and the Bible says in John 13, 1, knowing everything why he was there, where he was going. He knows that he's getting ready to be handed over to the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. He knows from there he's going to go to Pilate and to Herod and be humiliated and beaten. He knows he's going to be nailed to the cross like a criminal. He knows all those things. He knows the price he's getting ready to pay. And what does he do? This is my body. And he gives thanks. He gives thanks. To me, I don't know about you, but to me that is so mind-blowing and so humbling at the same time. God himself is there in their midst, knowing all things. Are going to... The Bible says, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Because he knows, well, Hebrews puts it this way, that he endured the despising shame of Calvary, the cross. He endured for the joy that was set before him. 
We may not be thankful for a moment until we see what the moment's really all about. Some of us are in this room maybe experiencing some difficult moments. One day you're going to discover why you experienced that difficult moment, and you're going, to have a, you're going to have a time of thanksgiving. It's best to do it by faith now. And honor the Lord by faith now, because He promised you, and He promised every one of us who are truly born of God that, hey, all things work together for good to them that love God or the called, or to those who are called according to His purpose. If we love God, we're responding to the call of God. It may be a difficult trial. There may be a value of a shadow of death in our life, but I want you to know we can give thanks. We give thanks, and Jesus exemplifies that. If anybody else, from a worldly perspective, anybody say, you know what, I'm getting ready to go through, you know, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm not going to do this. But no, he knows who he is. He knows where he is. He knows why he is where he is. He knows what's coming, and he knows what's beyond that. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Why are you doing this? Your name is mentioned in that moment. Your life changed, just mentioned that moment. The grace of God is displayed in that moment. He gives thanks, and then he says he blesses it. And by the way, it is still blessed today. Can you imagine, ever since the Lord Jesus instituted this, and in that moment where God blesses it, I mean the blessing of God has maintained and sustained and been retained upon this institution ever since it's been given to us in the first occasion. For centuries, 21 centuries Churches, believers, have been taking the Lord's Supper for ages have gone by in response to remembering Jesus by virtue of communion. And we have experienced, along with millions of others who've taken it with a pure heart and with a right heart, the blessing of God, the grace of God, the beauty of holiness, and the beauty of worship every time we've taken it with a right heart. It's still blessing generations to come until He comes. And then it says, he broke the bread. This is my body. Represents everything I'm getting ready to experience for you. It is broken. Now we know in the reality of the prophecy that not one bone of his, of his body would be broken, but his body was broken. It was torn. It was shredded by whips, pierced with thorns, pierced with sword. And it, he was broken. For us is the beauty of it. But one of the themes that comes out of the whole book of Hebrews is for us. Better things for us, new things for us. When you look at the cross and the journey of the cross, you realize it's for me, it's for you, it's for us. It is, not for him, it's for us. For the glory of God, yes, but for us he's done this. We get to enjoy that. He broke it, he blessed it, and he shared it. He shared himself. He shared his blood. He gave himself. He shared his life. Then it says he took the cup. Basically, he did the same thing with thanksgiving for his presentation of it and blessing of it so that we too can understand that Jesus' life was taken and torn and shredded for us that we might have life. And the real nutrition of life is the Spirit of God living in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And his blood was represented by that cup that was filled with what we call the blood of the grape. It represented his precious, unadulterated, unblemished, untainted sacrifice for your sin and for my sins. Take and drink this. Today, I think we begin, if we really concentrate on what the Lord's Supper is really all about, we should see just how blessed we are that we can receive it. And not just receive it, we can receive it together as His bride. Just as those men were gathered in that upper room where the very first fruits of the bride, the pillars of the church, we've come out of that group. We belong to that great family. And we enjoy this great blessing of God. Now, in the context of all this, the, there's this deep state of fellowship that's going on. There's this love, there's this excitement, there's this, this wonder of it all. And then he tells them that someone is among us who's going to betray him. Starts out, it's kind of a, the narrative of the story. He says, you know, that Jesus, knowing who he was, and he's loving his disciples to the end, and Satan had already put into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. Jesus says, someone's going to betray us, someone among us. And it would have been better if that guy had never been born than if he had been born and do what he's getting ready to do. 
Listen to John chapter 13, the same narrative of John. He says in verse 21, he says, When Jesus had thus said, he became troubled in his spirit. And he testified and said, Truly I say unto you, that one of you will betray me. And the disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know which one he was speaking of. Nobody was expecting that. Then they were, there, was, there was reclining on Jesus' breast one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And most of you are familiar with that would probably be the Apostle John, who often referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. And by the way, don't let John steal all that. You are also the disciple, if you're a child of God, that Jesus loves. Then it says, Simon Peter therefore gestured to him, said, tell us, who, who's, he, who's he talking about? And he, leaning back on Jesus' breast, said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus therefore answered and said, The one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give to him. So when he dipped the morsel, he took and he gave it to Judas, the son of Iscariot. If you read in Matthew and in Mark, it says it like this. When they're asking, Lord, who is it? It reads like this. Surely it's not me. Or you could even put it like this. Is it me? Am I the one? And I think probably everyone asked that but the one who was guilty of it. And I really believe that it's, it's, a, it's a sombering moment that we should all ask ourselves that same question. Lord, is it me? Is it me? I think that's when we come to the Lord's Supper, we should be asking that question. Is it me? Isn't it interesting that every instance recorded in Scripture, whether it's what the Lord says in the Gospels about it, or whether it's what Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians, that the Lord revealed to me what took place that night, they all have this little capsulation to the beginning. And the night the Lord Jesus took bread, he was betrayed. And see, here's all the disciples, Lord, is it me? I think we should have enough common sense about ourselves and enough humility about ourselves and enough honesty with ourselves to say, Lord, I am capable of betraying you. In my flesh, as Paul said, there's no good thing. He said that after he was saved, all right? I have the capacity to betray the Lord. I have the capacity to fail. I have the capacity to sin. I don't want to be a betrayer. Is it me, Lord? Am I the one? So there's this moment where there's this troubled spirit of Jesus, now troubled spirit of all those who are in the room, where there's this, well, just who is it? Is it I? I think this is the heart of David when he said, Lord, search me. Try me. See if there be any unclean, anything that would defile me, Lord. Is there anything in my heart, anything in my life that would cause me to turn my back on you, to say no to you? We're tempted every day to do that as children of God. And if, we don't aware, if we're not aware of that, or if we think we've kind of arrived to some place because we've been saved long, we'd never do that, be cautious. Paul put it this way. Beware. Pay attention. He said, lest you think you stand. When you think you stand, you better beware lest you fall. In other words, there's no point in your spiritual life that you're not going to need the empowering grace of God on your life. There's no place you're going to get to in your spiritual walk on this side of heaven where you're going to have everything just straightened all out and you're just going to walk perfectly spotless and sanctified. Sanctification is a cleansing process until the day we're actually glorified. That's why the Bible says, you know, let every man examine himself to see if he's in the faith. Another passage where Peter writes, you need to make your calling and your election sure. You go directly to the Lord like the disciples say, hey, Lord, is it me? Is there something in me that would, that's a wicked way, as David called it? I think those who fail are those who fail to ask or think that failure's a possibility. That's when pride enters in. And this is where you see Judas Iscariot. Jesus, in talking about the Lord's Supper through the Apostle Paul, Paul said it this way, if we would judge ourselves, we wouldn't be judged of the Lord. If we can ask ourselves that question and be honest, say, Lord, I have that capacity. I need you to strengthen my life. I need you to fill me. I need to trust you. Psalms 41 gives a little prophetic verse about this moment. It says, where, where the psalmist says, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Now, I don't believe that Judas to be a deceiver in the beginning. I think he entered in like, like the others in, in regard to, he's excited about Jesus, uh, the, the, the messianic promises. I think he's looking at it from perhaps maybe a selfish point, though. But aren't we all in some point when, when God says you can have peace instead of misery, you can have life instead of death? I mean, there's something about self that does enter that to some degree. It's the intelligible self if you make the choice. And God sanctifies you and clarif clarifies the, the goals and the, and the object lesson of your heart and life is to bring glory and honor to God. But here, here's, here's Judas. And, and I don't know when, when it happens. Obviously, the Lord puts him in charge of the, the money. And I don't believe he did that because it necessarily that he was trying to tempt him. I've heard people say that before. 
or to prove him. Jesus knew who he was to start with, all right? But Judas does nonetheless follow along and becomes part of the disciples. He goes out, he sees the miracles, he's part of the miracles, he sees the glory of God, but there's something happened. He's never been converted, he's never been changed, he's never been transformed. He's, he's like the Bible talks about, you know, the wheat and the tare. The tare grows along with the wheat, right beside it, the same field. It's like the seed that was sown among the, the soil or the seed that was sown among the thorns. There's no transforming place where the roots really enter in. That's what happens when you really give your life to Christ. The roots come. In fact, the book of Revelation calls Jesus not only lamb, it calls him the root. All right, The root takes root. And once you get root, then you can have fruit. No root, no fruit. Amen. And here's Judas, he has no fruit. In fact, before this, Mary is anointing Jesus for these last moments of sacrifice that he's getting ready to make for us. Days before this, and by the way, the disciples, that's when they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And then Mary anoints Jesus with this costly perfume, and Judas pipes and says, oh man, what a waste. Jesus rebuked him. You know, you don't have me with you always. She knows this. And he's rebuked. And maybe it's there that Judas, for the first time, realizes he sees right through me. He sees right through me. Cuts right through me. Time to quit playing the game. And now in this moment, can you imagine what it would be like? Twelve of your closest friends, the Lord Jesus is there. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, somebody's going to betray me. Who is it? And Jesus says, I'll tell you who it is. I'm going to sop this bread. And I'm going to give it to the guilty one. Can you imagine the tension in the room in that moment? And he turns to Judas and hands it to him. What you're going to do, do quickly. Back when the oil was, the perfume were being poured upon Jesus, he could have stopped there and said, you know, I can't believe I'm so selfish. The Lord's rebuked me. I need to receive that rebuke and repent. He didn't. Jesus hands him that bread with that sop, and he doesn't repent. And I find the same is true. When we come face to face with the Lord, and he convicts us, and we're exposed, right? I know I'm a sinner. If we're not humbled by that, we get hardened by that. And Judas probably walks out of the room, I can't believe he embarrassed me in front of everybody like that. I can't believe that. Whatever his thoughts were, we don't know the inside story other than that Satan, deceptive powers were being yielded to from some point in his life and he kept giving over to them. And that night it says then Satan after that entered into him and he betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. There was another betrayal and denial that took place that night. It was Peter who denied knowing him. Remember that? We'll talk about that in another sermon. But the difference was, and we'll talk more about this, is the fact that the difference between real sorrow and worldly sorrow the sorrow of just saying, I got caught, versus the sorrow of saying, you're right, I'm wrong. Where it leads to repentance. Godless sorrow, the Bible says, works to repentance. Worldly sorrow can work to arrogance, hard-heartedness. How many times has the Lord convicted you of something? You just turn him off. You say, I don't hear that. The world hears the message of grace and repentance and the gospel message, and they're offended by it. Who do you think you are to tell me you're the only way? Who do you think you are to tell me I've got to follow you? Who do you think you are? They're offended by it. They don't understand what's all going on. So here's the Lord's Supper. It's the Lord's last gathering with his disciples. And there's no repentance. We'll close with this last event that takes place in the upper room. Probably some of the most difficult words in Scripture. I mean, what could be more awful? He says, been better than ever been born, right? There are some tough scriptures. I mean, in Deuteronomy 27 says, Cursed is he who does not confirm the words of the law by doing them. In other words, that's pretty tough. Because cursed ultimately means you're going to die and you're going to go to hell. Now, that's a lost message today, isn't it? Without Christ, you die, you lose. You've lost everything. And not only that, there's eternal life, but it's an eternal living death in a place called hell. There's another rough passage. We like to pull John 3.16 out and ignore John 3.36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. 
Those are tough words. But let me tell you, whether you choose to believe those words or not, they are still fact. Because they were not uttered by a man, they were uttered by God himself, whose son came and clothed himself in flesh to pay the price in his flesh for your sins. And if you reject that, you reject all hope. It's another tough passage where it's being rebuked. Remember the person in Acts chapter 13 who wanted to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit? He says, you're full of deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. Will you not cease to make crooked straight ways of the Lord? What, what's going on here? Here's what's going on is that, that there's a rebuke from God. He calls this guy, you're a deceiver, you're fraudulent, you're the son of the devil, you're the enemy of all that's righteous. That's pretty hard words. But I think these are the most difficult words of all. When Jesus says the Son of Man's about to go, just as written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better, would have been good for that man if he'd not been born. Those are hard words. But those are words that are every one should hear. Woe. You see the word woe in scriptures. It's, it's, a, it's a, a cry of condemnation and judgment. And when the Lord says woe, I mean, there's, no one can ever say peace be unto you <laughs> if there's a woe that's been pronounced. These are hard words. Almost as hard as those words, depart from me, you work of iniquity, I never knew you. But those words are still in Scripture, and they cannot be ignored. And the church today in so many ways is ignoring this essential part of the message of, of, of the gospel. People must know that Jesus Christ is the way, He is the truth, He is the life. And should that be rejected, and should that be ignored, or should that be laughed or scorned or scoffed at, or just perfectly just walk away from it, there's really no hope. Christ Jesus came to set us free because the judgment of death is upon every one of us because we've all sinned. And the gospel is glorious. It shouldn't be rejected. But if we reject it, then the same can be said. It had been better if I'd never been born than to be born and to be exposed to truth and reject the truth for my own selfish, willful ways. Because I didn't want to hear it. It would have been good for that man that woman to have never been born. How horrible, how terrible a fate waits for any person who denies the only hope of life, and the only hope of life is Jesus Christ the Lord. I, folks, that is why I preach the way I preach. I believe these words are true. I believe if anybody can be honest with you about the course of your life, then they ought to be taking you in the course of your life to the cross where Jesus Christ is seen clearly demonstrating love, mercy, and the Bible uses this word propitiation. He took your place in all that so you wouldn't have to. Judas, he was among the group, but he was content. Instead of yielding his heart to just mask his life over with religiosity, and that is so true of so many today in so many circles. There's a lot of religious people. I, I remember shortly after I gave my life to Christ, hearing Billy Graham make a statement. He said, you know, I believe that about 80% of Southern Baptist church members are lost. I just was taken back by that. How can that be? Until I got into ministry... And still I started preaching in churches all across the country, out of the country. I began very clearly see it. And then when I became a pastor, I clearly began to see. It is, it is so easy to be deceived. It's so easy to just kind of get religion and mask over the selfishness and the pride and the lust and the immorality and the things that are going on. Just mask it over with a little religion, just like Judas did. Just kind of cover it up, paint it over. Well, I was good, and I did this, and I did that. I'm not bad at so-and-so. And I got, you know, I did get baptized. I prayed a prayer. But no real heart commitment to Jesus is the Lord, the Savior, the deliverer of your life. You just go through some kind of moral code of ethics and, and miss what it's all about. You miss life. 
you, you, that group will be clearly identified at the great white throne of judgment when Jesus says, you depart from me, I never knew you, and they will contend with him. They say, no, 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 you know, I did many mighty works. I, you know, I built churches, I had spiritual gifts, I did all these things. And Jesus said, I never knew you. That's a pretty definitive term, never knew you. You, you might have been religious, you had a, a pseudo-spirituality, but pseudo-spirituality is just religion. You never had a relationship. No knowing. No life ever came in. And really just gets down to one thing. You wouldn't yield your heart and the direction and the course and your sin, the course of your heart and life to Jesus Christ. To allow him to literally come in and you become a disciple. You really follow Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. It's free. Salvation's free. It's given to us as an act of God's mercy and grace. All I can do is accept it and just follow Jesus. That's the course. That's the pathway. That's the road. There is another road. You can take it. It's, a, it's broad and many are on it. And the Bible says it leads to destruction. When I heard that comment about 80%, I, after a short time of ministry, I began to realize, well, you know, I, I, one thing really, I think, first got to me as a young evangelist, some pastor would call me, and we, we had what we called, the, uh, I called it the funny papers. It was a book put out by the Baptist. <laughs> no disrespect intended. But it had every church in the, in the convention listed and what they gave in their tithes and offerings and what they gave to missions and what they had in membership and what they had in Sunday school enrollment and what they had... You know, just, just basic t statistics on each church in the convention. They turn in annual report to the convention. And I would say, okay. They'd say, well, you, I want you to come and have a good revival. I'd say, oh, by the way, i just look something up on that church. And I'd look and say, well, that church has, a, wow, there's a 1,000 members. And you'd get there, and there'd be 200 people. You see, half the folks on most Baptist church rolls, and it's not just Baptist, it's across the denominational lines. Half the folks who are on that membership roll never come. I mean, 50% of them are never... You couldn't find them with a search warrant. <laughs> uh, except maybe at Easter and Christmas. You know, it's the CEOs. Christmas, Easter only. <laughs> it really is. You know, it's, 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 you can be humorous, but you know as well as I do, it's heartbreaking. There's, no, there's no, con no context in their life for God. There's no place for God, you know. It's just not there. And then you got to realize there's a bunch of them who just go because their wife makes them, their husband makes them, their mama makes them. You know, they're just there because they have to be. Where would you be today? <laughs> then you realize, well, that's 50%, and then another 20, 30% of that massive group, you know, that, you know, they attend occasionally. They, really, they don't even open this book, there's no, no desire to discover the will of God for their life. There's no, no burden for people, friends and family, dying and going to hell. There's no fruit of grace, and satisfaction and contentment, peace that God gives. I have good news for you. You can throw away the veil of religion and come into full life through Jesus Christ. But I can't tell you how many times I've given invitations in churches and rallies and arenas and school auditoriums and football fields and little churches as well. I never forget in evangelism being in a church here in the, in the spring area and watching one night give an invitation. Had everybody stand to their feet at that point and it was an evangelistic style meeting so I gave an evangelistic appeal to come forward and give your life to Jesus Christ. I said something like this. I said, if you're here tonight and this message has touched your heart, it's the gospel. God loves you. He has a plan for your life. You can be saved. God can forgive you of your sin. Doesn't matter how bad it is. I said, but if you'd like to give your heart to Jesus tonight, and you, you want me to pray for you with every head bowed and every eye closed. People are standing with their heads bowed. I said, if you'd like me tonight just to pray that you would make that great decision for life for Jesus, you know you need to. Why don't you slip your hand up and you signify, Pastor, that's me, Evangelist, that's me. And a bunch of people raised their hand. But I noticed right in the middle of the auditorium, there was a, a father and his probably maybe eight, nine-year-old son, maybe ten. And they both raised their hands. And I remember the little boy looking up at his dad and smiling when he saw his dad raise his hand. I mean, it just, it really reached out and touched my heart. But then I said, 
I want to pray for you. And I said, in fact, I'd like you to pray this prayer. And I prayed a prayer, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, they come into my life tonight. Come in my life. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. But I give my heart to you. But I give my heart to you. I'll trust you tonight. I'll trust you tonight as my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, forgive me of my sin. In Jesus' name, forgive me of my sin. I saw a mouth moving. And I said, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to look up here at me. A lot of people raised their head and looked up at me. I said, you know, tonight, if you trust in your heart, hopefully that's what you've just done. The Bible says that's where it starts. But it says not only do we believe in our heart in Romans, it says we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. Everywhere Jesus went, he gave invitations. Invitations start in the, in the Garden of Eden when God said to Adam, where are you? And he called him to come out, come forth. Moses, standing before the congregation of Israel, said, whoever is on the Lord's side, after a great sin, you know, they kept, if you're ready to get right with God, he said, I want you to come forward, come to me. And those who want to get right began to come forward. And throughout the Old Testament and all throughout Jesus' ministry, you see Jesus calling people, calling, precious gospel call going out, offering life, some receiving, some rejecting it. I said, so you have a choice to make right now. If you really want to be what the Lord has and you really want to follow Christ, I said, I want to pray for you as a group. And I want you to, you know, your way of saying and confessing Jesus as Lord, and that would be first of all by coming forward, and we'll pray together and make that confession out loud together. I said, so if you'd like to receive Jesus tonight as your Lord and Savior, I want you to step out from where you're standing and meet me right here. People began to come forward, and I looked at that moment right there, and I saw that little boy look up at his dad. Dad had his eyes closed, holding on to that pew in front of him. Knuckles turned in white. The little boy kept looking. Daddy didn't go, and neither did the little boy. That's not the kind of father I want to be. It's not the kind of man I want to be. I don't know what happened to them. Years later they got saved or not. Who knows? But God forbid that it be written over any heart of, this, of any person in this room who's heard this message that says, it'd been better for them not to have been born. The call is the same today. You can give your life to Christ. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. You walk out of this room a new person. Wash, no longer trying to veil yourself up like Adam trying to cover yourself with fig leaves. God covered Adam in a special way. He slew an animal. Blood was shed so that Adam could be covered. But the real covering came up on Golgotha where his blood was shed. The true Lamb of God was shed. And we can be covered now, it says in Scripture, with the righteousness of God. Greatest gift of all, God gave his Son. I'd ask you today, the scripture says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. The Bible says in 1 Peter, make your calling and election sure. Like David, Lord, is there any harmful way in me, any wicked way? If you're here without Christ, we'll give you the opportunity to pray a prayer like that in a moment. If you're here as a Christian, your prayer needs to be different. It needs to be specific. You've got a dirt, dirty heart, dirty feet, so to say, that need to be cleansed. The Lord still is cleansing dirty hearts and feet. Praise God. The blood is still powerful. And God will wash you and forgive you and will be taken away. What a great message of hope, isn't it? Amen. Gospel message is glorious. Rewards are abundant and profound. But if you reject him, you reject all hope. Would you stand with your heads bowed?